Hello everyone, so welcome to our webinar on governing during a pandemic. What are the key things trustees need to be focused on? Thank you all for listening. My name is Josie, I'm Capacity Building Programs Manager here at NCVO and I'm going to be chairing today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dan Francis, our Lead Governance Consultant here at NCVO and also by Lorraine Young, a board advisory consultant and past president of the Chartered Governance Institute. So Lorraine has very recently written some good practice guidance for virtual board and committee meetings and so we are delighted that she can join us today to share some of the learnings from that guidance. In these unprecedented times we here at NCBO are acutely aware of the enormous challenges trustees of all charities are facing. Trustees are faced with having to adapt their own ways of working individually and collectively as a board to a completely new environment. And they are also having to step up to the challenge of leading their organisation through what will be and is an incredibly difficult period. This will crucially mean working with and supporting their organisation's executive, whether these are paid staff or volunteers. So with this in mind, here is what we're going to be covering in this webinar. And so we'll start with Lorraine, who's going to be highlighting some good practice guidance on meeting remotely, how to do this effectively and legally. So for some of you, the tech stuff might feel quite basic, but do uh, keep listening as we do gear up to more complicated matters. Dan will then be taking us through some key bits of Charity Commission guidance and explain what it means for trustees. Lorraine is then going to share some thoughts on things to consider when working with your executive. And finally, Dan will finish off by sharing what he thinks trustees need to think about now and in the medium term. So I'm now going to hand over to Lorraine to talk about meeting remotely. Thank you, Josie. So we've run some polls um, to give us a bit of a background before we actually start talking about effective meetings, just to see what experience people had with this. So the first question, if we could move to that, please, was have you taken part in a virtual board meeting? And we, that was anything other than a face-to-face -face meeting. And most people, so just over 70%, have taken part in virtual meetings with audio and video, which I think is really encouraging, considering we've only been in lockdown for just over a month. Um, and then a few people, about 5% just with a phone and about a quarter, just under a quarter, um, haven't taken part in a meeting yet. So quite a, a big chunk though still to, to jump in and have a go at these virtual meetings. So hopefully this session will be helpful for you. And then we asked people how they would rate the experience. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Whether people found the experience very good, good, satisfactory or poor. So we had about 22% thought it was very good, 39% were good, 17% satisfactory and poor 1%. And I found that really encouraging actually, and that then people who haven't joined a meeting obviously wouldn't rate it. But to have um, only 1% poor and 17% satisfactory, I thought those were, were encouraging results. So I could see everybody's doing very well at the moment. So if we could move to the next slide, please. We're saying here the technology is not everything, and yes, there is going to be a but coming. So in the guidance note, we look at other things in technology, and I'll be coming on to those a little later. But I'm going to start with the technology, because if you're moving from face-to-face -face meetings and good practice for those, then actually the technology is the biggest difference and the biggest change. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. Going to look at how you can tackle that and to get the best outcome. So the first thing might be quite basic, but if you're working with trustees and lots of people might be volunteers, this isn't necessarily a business thing. And so some of these things do need a little bit of attention. So making sure everybody's got the right equipment, that isn't actually too difficult, even if you're doing a video meeting. Most laptops now have got cameras and microphones incorporated. And if people are working from a desktop computer, they can simply add a webcam and those are not expensive and they're usually quite okay to get hold of. People may find the use of headphones helpful, may cut out some background noise when they're listening, and it may be that that helps their audio to be picked up better by the microphone. Smartphones are obviously helpful if people might need to text or message people during the meeting. And for anybody who simply cannot deal with the 
with the internet, it should be possible for them to join a meeting by phone, even if the rest of you are doing it by video. Obviously, you do need a reasonable internet connection. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. But one slightly techy point to mention here is that if you can manage to have a wired connection rather than a wireless connection to the internet, that should make the speed that you're connecting at much, much faster. So mine goes from 70 to 400, that's download speed of megabytes per second. And that does make a huge difference to the quality of the communication you can have. So that may be something to aspire to, because I imagine with lots of people working from home, it will be with laptops and wireless connections. So that's not a main thing to worry about, but it's something that you might like to investigate a little bit later on. Then do you go with a phone or a video meeting? And I think as we've seen from the results of the poll, lots of people are now trying video meetings. It could be perceived that from a technical point of view, it's harder. I think in practice, most of us have found that it isn't necessarily harder at all. And in fact, it can be more difficult to communicate on a telephone conference when you can't see anybody else who's, who's on the call. It's also quite nice at the moment when we're all rather restricted in our movements to see people. So you may not see them face to face in a meeting, but even seeing them on screen is nicer than not seeing them at all. So that's pretty good. It can be tiring and there can be connectivity issues. But we'll come on to the connectivity issues in a moment. In terms of the platform that you use or the app that you use, there are lots of different virtual meeting apps that you can use. We've probably mostly come across Zoom and there are others. In the guidance note in Appendix 5, we've listed a few and giving you a bit of comparison for them. So some large organisations will mandate which system that you use and you may not have a choice and in that case it's just how to learn to use it in the best way. Um, and for other organisations you may have a choice. So if I was looking I would choose one which is easy to use for everybody and which does all the things I wanted to do so it's functionality. So those would be the things I would be comparing. You need to ensure you're happy with the security that the app offers. And that will depend. We tend to take a risk based approach. So for some organisations, what you're discussing may not be particularly sensitive or confidential. Um, and for others, it may be much more um, sensitive and you'll need to perhaps take a slightly different approach in the security. So there's been some publicity around Zoom because although this is a very popular app, there were some questions about its security and they have addressed a lot of those now. So. For any platform, you don't want people joining your meeting who aren't part of your organisation. And you can prevent that by having password access um, and by making people go into a waiting room and you allow them in when you're ready. So you only admit the people that should be in your meeting. So those are the sorts of things that you can look at. Then you've got to make sure everybody can use the platform. And there are some lots of tutorials on YouTube which are quite useful. And I would suggest that perhaps you send links around to those for people who've not used the app before. I find the shorter they are, the better they are to follow. Some YouTubers like to do a whole half an hour and they can be a bit tiresome and give you information you don't need. So it's worth having a look around to find the best ones for your trustees to watch. Can be helpful if people are not familiar with the tech to offer them one to one practice sessions, just five or 10 minutes. So make sure they can join and know the basics about putting their microphone and camera on and off. For one board, we offered everybody to get together a couple of days before the board meeting, just so we could all make sure we could join and see and hear one another and that the technology worked. So that might be a thing to do as well if you've got quite a few people joining. And I'm going to come on and talk a little bit later on about good practice on use being with camera on a video call. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So whoever's hosting the meeting, that's the person who's setting it up and opening it. If you open it in good time, at least 10 minutes before the meeting's due to start and encourage everybody who's joining to join in good time. Then if you have any little technical glitches, it won't eat into your meeting time. You'll have a little bit of time in advance to, to sort those out. If you're lucky enough and a large enough organisation to have IT support, that's great. I always have them on standby, but it can be quicker for some of the simple things to learn to be self-sufficient. I've worked for myself for a long time. I'm used to scrabbling under the desk, sorting out the cables, and I guess we're all doing that a bit more now. The technology has got some great things that you can use. I've listed some of them there. We've talked about waiting rooms. Um, 
there are things like virtual whiteboards. So if you're doing a regular board meeting, you may think you don't need one of those, but if you're brainstorming a problem, you may find it's helpful. But I would say with all of these, keep it simple to start with and make the tech appropriate. So don't offer things to people that aren't really needed for your meeting, because that will just be a distraction and not particularly helpful. Do you have a backup plan? So sometimes the sound can be difficult on these calls. There are different options you can do. People can all leave the meeting and join again. Sometimes that might help. Sometimes it can be helpful to switch off some or all of the video cameras and that may then improve the sound quality. And if it's a really real disaster, I'd recommend you don't try and continue if the sound is really terrible because people simply won't be able to hear um, and or they, it just will give people a headache. Um, and so then the backup plan would really be to have dial in details. And on most of the apps now, when you set up a meeting, it would generate phone numbers for you to use. So those could be circulated with the original invite to say, you know, this is the backup plan and these are the phone numbers if we need to move to the backup plan during the meeting. But hopefully all of those will, will work. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So I have heard several people say that while they're working from home, they don't need to worry about what they're wearing, only from the waist up. Uh, I would suggest that's not necessarily the case, because if you're on camera, you have to get up during the meeting to collect something. Everybody will see what you're wearing. So just very briefly, I think wear what you would normally wear to the meeting, unless somebody's giving you guidance otherwise, but be comfortable. Um, and I think that's best avoid the pyjamas and don't do calls from bed either. <laughs> OK, so all about the camera. These are just some quick tips on being on camera. Obviously, what you're talking about in your meeting is far more important than this, but there are some little tips which can still help make the meeting effective. So when you're speaking, try to look at the camera, because in that way you'll be making eye contact with the people on the other end who are seeing you. It's very natural to look at the screen, to look at other people on the screen, and you look into their eyes and thinking that you're giving them eye contact, but that doesn't work on camera. You need to look at the camera. Obviously, if you're reading notes or referring to slides, you can't always look at the camera as well. And that obviously doesn't matter. I think it's just to do your best. If you can smile or put your face in a friendly pose rather than off putting one, even if you're anxious, try not to look anxious because that will come across as being unfriendly. So again, just a small tip there. Try to have a background which isn't too distracting. Um, you can have virtual backgrounds on some of the apps. Those are perhaps better left for social calls because people might be a bit distracted if you look like you're on the beach and they can also be a bit glitchy. Lighting. The best tip here is if it's possible, have light in front of you or to the side of you. If you have light, so a window behind you, that will cast your face into shadow and make it much harder for people to see you. So that's just a nice to do if it's possible with your, uh, your wherever your location is. One of the key things with microphones is, is the background noise um, and muting and unmuting your microphone it's one of those things it's very easy to forget to do we all do it so we try and speak we're all on mute we try and speak and realize nobody's listening to us and that's nothing personal we just forgot to unmute our microphone the other issue is when we finish speaking we need to mute again and if you if you don't i've had noises so snoring i've heard heavy breathing neither of those were great and one meeting we did laugh because uh, we could hear splashing and it did really, really did sound like somebody was in the bath and we never quite uh, worked out if they, we didn't quite like to ask if they really were. But if you're hosting the meeting, there may be a control which allows you to mute and unmute people. So if people forget, that can be a very helpful thing to do. If we just move on then to the final, I think it's a final slide or we may have another poll. Oh, we've got another poll. OK, so on this poll, we ask people which platform they'd use most often. There are lots, but we just gave a few choices. And over 70% or 70% of people said they'd use Zoom the most often. Skype was next at 19%. We asked people for that to be Skype and Teams because Teams is replacing Skype in lots of cases. Go to meeting was six, phone conference was one, another was 4%. So Zoom has obviously got the most popular following for now. And I have to say, when I've used it, I found it the easiest and the most flexible. It does more of what you want it to do than some of the others. OK, if we could move on, please. Thank you. So in terms of what you have on your meeting agenda at the moment, you may need to change what you would normally have. 
and it would be good to have a conversation between probably the chair of trustees and the exec to see what are the main priorities what is it you really need to be talking about at the moment putting those first some routine items might be best to be deferred or you might put them towards the end of the agenda so that you make sure you're covering the key points you might also want to think about the length of your meeting Two hours on a video call is probably enough. And even with two hours, you might want a little break after an hour. So people just, you know, have a break from the screen for a moment, get a drink and so on. So keep the agenda simple. And as we've mentioned before, keep the text simple. I think if you remember those points, you'll get a good outcome. Don't try and overdo anything at the beginning until people are more used to it. In the guidance note, we talk a lot about good practice for meetings generally. So it's all about people doing their normal thing, but having to do a little bit more. One example of that is the chair, for example, when you're trying to work out, uh, have an orderly debate and work out what everybody thinks. People may feel a bit intimidated with the technology or there may be other reasons. So it's perhaps good at the end of the discussion or nearing the end of the discussion to actually ask people, is, does anybody else want to contribute? And if there are people that you haven't heard from for, for a while, you may ask them by name. And that will be that will be a good thing, uh, but that's just a bit more than you would normally do. In Appendix 4 to the guidance note, we've given us some examples of ground rules. So have a look at those and see if it might be helpful to circulate those in advance. We've talked about communication and the last three bullet points. I'm going to wrap up all together and just say these are really difficult times. Um, people are you know, perhaps having to work from home when they don't normally. And it's great to just encourage one another for those who are more familiar with all of the technology and how this works to help those who perhaps aren't and try and get everybody up to speed. It's really important to get everybody's contribution and not to leave anybody out. And we can all try and do that. After the meeting, it's great to get some feedback to see how you might do things better next time. But it's good to be positive and point out what went well, as well as what might go better next time and try to avoid any blame because everybody will be doing their best. And then I'm sure over time we'll all get this done really well and improve. I'm not sure whether we'll actually enjoy it, but it may be that for some of us we can travel a little bit less. And that will certainly be helping with climate change, which is another big issue that people will be looking at um, for the future. And I believe that's my last slide and it's now going across to Dan. Well, thanks ever so much uh, for that, Lorraine. What I'm going to pick up on in the next section is uh, some of the key guidance which the Charity Commission have published. Um, and this is guidance that is specific to COVID-19. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to pick up on a couple of key areas. Um, the first thing that is worth saying, though, is that I think it is worth, if you haven't seen it already, uh, following that link that's embedded on this slide to the dedicated guidance. As I say, I'm going to pick up on a few key areas, um, but the Charity Commission has developed some detailed and dedicated guidance, which, which covers a whole range of different kind of management and governance areas. So it's worth checking out. Um, the first area that I want to pick up on, though, really does lead on from what Lorraine was saying around how do we keep meeting and how do we keep meeting effectively. One of the questions that we're getting most is how do we make sure that those meetings are still legal, that the decisions are still binding? Um, and I think for me the first message has to be to check those clauses in your governing document that allow uh, uh, to ensure that you're allowed to meet virtually. Um, most model documents now will include a clause that says that this is allowed, but if your governing document hasn't been updated in some time, uh, that then, the, then it might be silent on this. Where it is silent, the Charity Commission's typical guidance says that provided trustees can still see and hear each other, um, then they are comfortable with you proceeding on that basis. Um, However, that might prohibit telephone meetings in normal circumstances. Yet, we're not in normal circumstances, and the Charity Commission in its specific COVID-19 guidance has said uh, that where there is no clause in your governing document and you decide to hold meetings on the phone or using other digital solutions, we will understand, but you must record this decision uh, that you have been able to demonstrate 
uh, doing so for good governance. So essentially, they're being really pragmatic here, and they're saying, you know, even if there is no clause allowing you the power to hold these meetings, then if you provided you record the decision to hold hold such meetings remotely, uh, then they will be understanding. I think if there is a clause expressly prohibiting uh, such meetings, I would kind of say that at that point, you should probably get in touch with the Charity Commission to also notify them that you're going to have to meet remotely. Um, and that would mean that you are in breach of your governing document. So I, I think that's the point at which I would uh, I, I would escalate or and contact to let them know that you are going to need to do that. Um, another area where the Charity Commission have developed some specific guidance is around um, the question around can our charity help tackle COVID-19? Now, again, in normal times, this is something which comes back to, is this activity in line with our charitable objectives? Uh, and and in, in essence, what the Charity Commission is saying is that nothing changes there in terms of charity law and trustees' responsibilities to advance their charitable uh, objectives. But there may well be opportunities to be flexible in terms of the nature of the work you do. So in that guidance, they list a whole range of kind of charitable objectives, which they consider, you know, the supporting of the, of the, of the effort to tackle COVID-19 naturally it would fit with me. So, you know, advancement of education or health, these are kind of areas where it's fairly obvious and you could pivot your work. But they also give examples uh, of, of charitable purposes like arts and culture, for example, where the sort of ability of the charity to pivot and support the efforts in tackling COVID-19 may not be immediately obvious. But actually, they give an example of an arts charity that is providing kind of online classes or access to kind of uh, exhibitions or displays of art, which helps to kind of relieve some of the other knock on or indirect uh, uh, challenges associated with the pandemic and still means that the charity is advancing its core purpose. And those are the kinds of discussions which I think boards should be having. Uh, about how can we help uh, this either directly or indirectly. In their guidance, the Charity Commission though are clear that you must make sure that you are observing um, any restrictions that are set out in your governing document. Uh, and they do also point to the fact that, you know, you could potentially change uh, your, your purpose or, 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 or your governing document to allow you to do more things more flexibly. Um, but, I, you know, I think that does involve a process and it's much better to perhaps be kind of uh, imaginative and creative about the way in which you advance your existing objects. Um, one area which we're keen to flag, uh, which the Charity Commission have, uh, ha have put some specific guidance together on, um, is serious incident reporting. The reason I want to flag it is because what the Charity Commission have said in their COVID-19 guidance is that normal rules still apply here. Uh, and you might think, well, well, why, why are you highlighting that business is as usual in regard to serious incident reporting? And I think that this is important because it is about charity trustees assessing incidents is in the context of their own organisation. So it is not enough to say, well, this pandemic is affecting all charities in a serious way, that it is impacting on the income streams of all organisations, potentially me placing uh, staff at risk of redundancy, or inhibiting the, the way in which we deliver our purposes significantly, uh, you know, and that that is impacting all organizations and so it doesn't warrant a report. What the Charity Commission is saying is that that is not, that is not sufficient, that actually you still need to assess the impact of the pandemic in the context of your own organization. Uh, and they give the example in their new financial guidance that if the scale of financial loss threatens your ability to operate 
or serve your beneficiaries or that there's risk of um, serious uh, losses to the charity, then those two examples are still cause for serious incident reporting. Um, so the message here is do not assess the impact of COVID-19 in the context of the wider sector. This is affecting everybody. Instead, you must still evaluate it in the context of your own organisation and use their guidance to decide whether or not you raise a serious incident report. And the final area oh, that I wanted to flag of the Charity Commission's um, specific guidance for trustees is that around uh, find the financial challenges which organisations will face. And this is a message which I've lifted from that guidance, which is from the Commission. They say, we understand that many trustees are having to cope with serious financial challenges uh, that will have a major effect on their charities and those that depend on them. The Charity Commission understand the kind of severity uh, and risk associated with the current circumstances. And so I think that their guidance in this regard is really helpful. And I would encourage any organisation that does think it's facing those financial challenges to, uh, to, to go and review it. The first thing which they suggest and which we would encourage is to develop a really clear picture of your cash flow forecast. What is a cash flow forecast? Well, it's essentially what money do we have coming in over, the, over a given period and what are our expected outgoings over that time? That will help you to identify any clear pinch points or areas where you may not, you may run into challenges. Uh, and you might want to do that not just for kind of uh, the, the coming uh, months, but also weeks and indeed days. So map it, map it out, look at your income, look at the likelihood associated with that income, uh, and, and then map that against your, the, your known expenditure. That will help you to develop a plan and you can develop a plan to perhaps reprofile uh, some, of, some of that spending or income. That might involve stopping or delaying activity to focus only on essential spending. Uh, it might involve dipping into your reserves. They are of course there for times of crisis uh, and for many organisations, this, this would be that. Um, the Charity Commission also say to understand your restrictions on your funding, and perhaps this is an opportunity for dialogue with those that fund you to say, look, I know you funded us for this specific reserve funded purpose, but can we use those funds elsewhere? Can, can we broaden the scope of what that's for? Or indeed, can we commit more of that to core? Lots of organisations I know are having that discussion already. Uh, and then opportunities for new or crisis funding. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and as we find out more about what the government has planned to support the sector and how that money will become available most crucially, um, I'm sure that we will be publishing more on that. Crucially, though, one message I want to get across is that if you or your fellow trustees are concerned about solvency of your organisation, it's worth reading our new guidance that we've published, this Charity Commission guidance, and also seeking professional advice. Although there have been promises to change the regulatory uh, the rules around solvency and trading, those haven't come into force yet. And I think that where there's a risk of insolvency, Trustees need to be very, very mindful of their duties in regard to wrongful trading uh, 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 and, uh, you know, making the very uh, well-advised decisions in that context. Um, and then the other thing I would say, just linking to what Lorraine mentioned earlier, of the importance of continuing decision making. Keep making collective decisions, probably meet more often if you find yourself in financial difficulty. Okay, uh, at which point I am going to hand back to Lorraine. Thank you, Dan. If we could go on to the next slide, that would be great. I need the, the one after this if it's hopefully coming. That's brilliant, thank you. 
Okay, so given what we're all going through at the moment, and in our families and perhaps with our friends and contacts and our day job, there'll be things that we're concerned about. Um, it, it may be that trustees have not necessarily focused on communicating with the charities of which they're, they're, they're linked. I'm not certainly saying that for all of them, but there may be some who, who haven't done anything because they've been busy with their own things or the exec may have been busy sorting out the particular crisis and haven't done a lot to contact the trustees. So this slide is just to encourage you if you're on a, the board of a charity to remember that you still need to be involved in that and if you haven't done anything yet then now would be a good time to to be um, getting in touch with them if we could move to the next slide please okay so what would you do if you're a trust trustee charity charity trustee and nobody's been in touch with you well the obvious thing then is to get in touch with your usual contact and to find out what's happening um, or it might be the chair of the board of trustees. So this is tricky. A lot of us would want to offer to support and help the executive with what's happening at the moment, but we need to do that in a way that's helpful. We'll talk about that in just a moment. What can assist with this if there's a good relationship between the chief exec of the charity and the chair? If they communicate regularly and then the chief exec can give the exec view to the, the chair and the chair can give the trustees view to the chief exec. So then at least everybody will know what's going on without all of the trustees contacting the executive at different levels at different times, which could really just be quite disruptive and distracting at the moment. However, trustees obviously have legal duties and potential liabilities, so it's important for them to know what's going on, particularly as if Dan was saying there might be some financial difficulties or any serious incidents that need to be considered or any other difficult matters. So that can be done in between times, by perhaps weekly email updates as to what's happening. And then there'll be board calls as they're needed. And as Dan also mentioned, these may need to happen more often than your regular um, meetings might do, but they may be shorter. So I think just being prepared for those sorts of things to change. If we could move on to the next slide, please. That's great. So yes, don't overdo the help. Now that may again depend on the charity. If you've got a very large charity with a good infrastructure and lots of resources, then the information flow will likely be coming from the charity to the trustees. But in much smaller organisations, it may be appropriate to offer some practical help and that may be really appreciated uh, when things are under pressure. But the best thing here is for your trustees to ask what help might be needed. Um, and if you're offering help to seek feedback to see if that's what's wanted. And I'm sure we would all want to be useful and offer help that's wanted rather than um, adding to the burden of, of trying to do things where the exec are happy to do it for themselves. In terms of support, there's quite a lot that can be done in terms of support. So where the exec are getting on with the, dealing with the particular issues that the charity is facing, that can be very demanding and quite difficult and tiring and stressful and all of those things. So for the trustees to come along and to provide some encouragement and some morale boosting by drawing attention to the bigger picture, perhaps trying to look forward a little bit and some good news stories that I'm sure will be really appreciated. The trustees could be used for, as a sounding board from the exec team, that particularly between the chief exec and the chair, but also um, at other levels if the trustees have particular areas of expertise, it may be appropriate for them to chat through things with members of the exec team. It's a time to be human and authentic and to admit that, you know, we're all struggling with this um, and, and come alongside the, the team at the charity and not to be too distant, but to, to be helpful and, and supportive in that way too, and to acknowledge that it's really difficult for everyone. And it's also important to appreciate the efforts that are being made, particularly where people are going over and above what might be normal or where they've got other things going on at home and they're putting extra effort in on their on their work and one way that could be that could be done is for the chair to thank the staff either by sending around a, an email to express the trustees appreciation or if they're if you're having virtual meetings for the team then perhaps the chair could join those for some or all of the time to thank the staff particularly so i think that's important obviously now is also the time to challenge so just because you're trying to support it doesn't mean that you shouldn't also be challenging because the issues that are being dealt with are unprecedented, 
and it's going to be really important, as I said in the previous section, for everybody to contribute, but trying to challenge in a constructive way, um, but, but get everybody thinking. And we need to be ready for the long haul. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. We hope it will be done more quickly, but realistically, it seems that things will be changing for quite a while. But it'll probably take longer than expected to get back to normal. And when we get to normal, normal might be different to what we've experienced before. And so this extra help and support that's needed by the trustees is not going to be a five minute thing. It could be something that you're needing to do for several months. Um, and I'm sure all the contributions that you make and the time that you give will be appreciated by the exec team. And I'm going to hand back to Dan now. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. So um, we've covered a lot of ground so far in this webinar. You know, we've looked there at how do we keep meetings being uh, happening and, and how do we make remote meetings effective. I've looked at some of the kind of regulatory context and some of the kind of specific things trustees should think about in terms of commission guidance. Uh, and Lorraine has really helpfully there looked at the kind of relationship with the executive and how do we continue to kind of support and challenge appropriately in this time. This final section, what I'd like to do is cover just some of the short and some of the long term thinking uh, that trustees should be committing themselves to um, right now. The first thing around short term thinking is is kind of where we've been operating for the last couple of weeks. And I, I did a bit of a brainstorm uh, of, of some kind of key questions that I think trustees should be looking uh, to ask and to try to address um, immediately. Um, so I'll just run through these. Um, how can we keep meeting and keep making those collective decisions remotely, committing yourself to all of the kind of key tips, guidance that Lorraine has uh, outlined, but also, you know, to make sure that everybody has access to those meetings, that you are still making governance decisions is really important at this time. Um, particularly when a lot of the decisions, I think, have been quite tactical at the moment, it is important that also the board is still functioning and still operating. That question, again, around how do we support our staff and volunteers, partly in terms of that support and challenge, but also on a kind of a personal level in terms of, you know, the impact on people's well-being, um, the ability to do their jobs in this difficult uh, time and thinking about how do we encourage staff and volunteers um, and how can we support them to do their work safely. Uh, I think there's a lot of stuff around making sure that we are creating kind of the right environment and culture, um, even at a time where things are quite challenging. Um, the third point is around we are in quite exceptional times and, and where an organisation kind of faces challenge or disruption to its work. And it can be quite normal, I think, to review the kind of delegation. What is it that the board wants to make decisions over or wants to be within its sphere? And what is it comfortable with others making decisions over? I'm thinking in particularly, particular that the executive, your senior managers or senior volunteers will need to have some, uh, perhaps some additional powers at this moment to make quick and nimble decisions that they wouldn't normally be delegated to them. For example, you know, whether or not to furlough particular teams or staff. Um, now, you as a board might want to make some decisions about delegating additional responsibility uh, at this time but also being clear about the kinds of decisions which even in this crisis, the board still wants to discuss, want to be aware of. There's kind of really important corporate decisions, perhaps around where to focus your in, in order to deliver your purpose, uh, perhaps around um, some of the stuff around finance, which I'm about to cover. Then this kind of question, which I covered in a little depth earlier, around real clarity over your financial position, making sure you really understand what is coming in and what is coming out, what needs to come out over the next few months, and being able to map and plan accordingly. Fifth, are we at risk of insolvency? Once you've done that mapping, are, is it clear that actually there are some real risks associated with 
having more expected outgoings than you have income. income. Or, and is that risk immediate or is it kind of something which will play out over the kind of medium term? And in that instance, seeking advice as early as you possibly can uh, and, and observing the rules on wrongful trading um, as, uh, uh, as, as we've kind of talked about a little earlier. Um, can we take advantage of government support? Uh, there's furloughing, which is the kind of continuing to pay staff, but keeping them uh, keep, keeping them on the payroll, but they're not working, uh, and reclaiming that money from government. We know that small, some of the, the business loans have now become available to charities that do, don't even have a kind of trading restriction has been lifted on that. Uh, and then we know that there's £750 million pounds being made available in various different um, uh, pots um, that is dedicated funding to frontline organisations. Across those kind of areas of support, are there ways in which the charity can continue to operate, perhaps support the organisation's long-term financial position? Must we focus or refocus our activity or funds enabled to, uh, to, to better deliver our purpose at this time? Um, and can we do that with the restrictions that we have in our governing documents? So it isn't just as simple for a charity to say, right, we're going to stop doing this and we're going to start doing this or start serving these people. You have to make sure that you're assessing that in the context of your charity's purpose and objectives. And it's a real important role for the trustees, that number seven. And then finally, can we partner with others to continue delivering our purpose at this time? I think we've seen some really good examples of this um, over, over the last couple of months, um, but those partners may not just be charities. You may want to partner with commercial organisations, with supermarkets, for example, uh, to distribute uh, food, or whether or not it's a pub, the, the NHS or other public sector uh, organizations to, 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 to support with the effort. Um, thinking about, you know, you're not dealing with this challenge in isolation and who is it that you can work with um, to better support your beneficiaries. So those are some of the kind of immediate and short-term challenges which, you know, I expect that most people listening, most boards will have been having the, those kinds of discussions. But it's the next slide, which contains kind of more medium term thinking, which I think a lot of trustees could really be forgiven for having not even considered yet. Um, you know, we are in the middle of a, of a crisis or, or, or a, of a real challenging time. And actually, if you say, let's kind of think about the long term, it can feel quite overwhelming. But it is still a very, very important role of trustees to have that medium or longer term thinking. And so this is what I suppose I would really encourage trustees and board members to think about is what is our what are our potential scenarios? And that can really help you, I think, formulate some of that medium term thinking. So scenario planning is making assumptions about what the future is going to be uh, and how your operating environment will change. Um, I think it's absolutely impossible to be certain at the moment around what those various scenarios are. That doesn't mean you shouldn't give it a go, try, try and develop a series of potential outcomes. So what are the, what are the steps to doing that? Well, first, I think you've got to ask, what are we most uncertain about for the future? Uh, second, in what ways might these uncertainties impact upon our charity? So this is where you're formulating perhaps three or four potential outcome scenarios. And you might want to attribute, try and think about some likelihood uh, and also some severity. So something which would be really quite uh, damaging, perhaps an extension of lockdown or a second peak or, or, of, the, of the pandemic and those kinds of really significant and severe issues um, through to you know returning to something like normal within a couple of months and try and map the various different uh, outcomes. Third is the identifying of those range of scenarios but but also thinking about the fallout for your beneficiaries and the work that you do for each, the, your staff and their well-being and their ability to do their jobs, how this 
each of those scenarios will impact on your income or your investments. Um, the impact on those that supply you uh, and also those that fund you and also your partners and other key stakeholders because you know this is this is as we said earlier affecting everybody then for each of your scenarios and i wouldn't encourage you to overdo it here but you know having a, a range of scenarios three or four uh, is a good idea you could perhaps develop some loose plans about the kind of key things that you would do to handle that situation that might involve for some a managed you know merger or, or, or closure at the most significant severe end of the spectrum but it also might just involve doing work differently delivering work differently speaking with your funders around repurposing funds etc etc number five identify those indicators you might expect to see for the scenarios um, so what i'm saying here is if you were to work back from that scenario what might be the kind of triggers along the way that you would expect to see that would tell you that you're en route to a particular outcome now again you can't be certain here but that does help you board plan and give you a sense of to which is of these is most likely and then six uh, i've got keep reviewing and keep tweaking based on your reality things are moving really quickly at the moment and i think it can make planning certainly medium term planning you know feel almost impossible that you are going to get stuff wrong in this uh, you know not in fact i'd be very surprised if any of your scenarios are on the money but if you continually tweak them if you help that will help you get to a point where actually you you have a managed situation a ma managed uh, plan for for any particular situation so keep reviewing keep it under under check uh, and keep revisiting okay so that's me done i'm going to hand over to josie now for the for the last section I just want to check that Josie can hear. Oh, sorry, I am. I was on mute. Apologies. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, so, yes, I think both you and Lorraine have really highlighted ways in which organisations can both adapt to the current climate, but also ways in which they can approach planning in what are incredibly uncertain times. And I think there's been some really important reminders about being kind to oneself and forgiving when one does make mistakes, which are inevitably going to happen, but also forgiving and kind to others. So before, um, just a final bit really, before we finish up uh, with this webinar, um, and it's a quick reminder of NCVO's practical support offer, and so some ideas of where you can go to get resources and help following this, following listening to this webinar. Um, so as you are all probably aware, we do have our NCVO know-how uh, guidance um, site um, and the tools and resources on that site are currently accessible for all organisations, so not just for NCVO members. And I particularly wanted to highlight our board basics governance section on that site, as well as NCVO's coronavirus section, which um, highlights a lot of kind of the upcoming uh, guidance that both Dan and Lorraine have mentioned uh, that the Charity Commission have produced but also signpost you to guidance in other areas of your organisation's operations. Um, secondly, I just wanted to highlight uh, that NCVO are delivering a series of webinars on topics relevant to the pandemic, so please do check out our training platform. Um, we have a webinar coming up tomorrow, but you might not have listened to this webinar by then, but we have one coming up on, on involving volunteers and then also another one mid-May on um, safeguarding volunteers and what you need to think about. So do check out our training platform. Um, the other thing is obviously along with this recording, you will see that we are signposting you to some, some relevant material um, and some of the guidance that we've highlighted in this webinar. So hopefully that will be of help. 
Um, and finally, we would love to hear your feedback on how useful you found today's content and what you're going to put into practice as a result. So please do fill out the survey monkey that is being sent round uh, with this recording. That's it from us. So many thanks for listening and do stay safe and well. <laughs>